Hello, my fellow Ripplers. This is Chris Miles, your cash flow expert and anti financial advisor. Guys, this show is for you and about you. Those of you who work so hard for your money, and you're ready for your money to start working harder for you today because you want that freedom, that cash flow, that prosperity now, not 30 or 40 years from now, if the stock market just smiles on you the right way, but you want that freedom now. So you can do what you love with those you love whenever you feel like. But guys, on top of that, you guys want to do more than just live a life of comfort and convenience. You want to be a rippler by creating a ripple effect through generations beyond you, through your family and those around you, that you could be a blessing in the lives of others. Guys, thank you for allowing me to be a blessing in your life, to create that ripple effect through you. Thank you for binging, sharing, and do everything that you guys do here. It's awesome. So thank you so much. Here's a quick reminder. Check out our website, moneyripples.com. Also, guys, subscribe to our YouTube page, the, the Money Ripples Chris Miles page. Check that out on, on, on YouTube right now and subscribe. So guys, uh, I want to talk about some of the rules that I have uh, for investing because so many times I hear people saying, is this a good opportunity or not? Should I do this or not? And the truth is we're not going to give you advice on the show, right? Because legally, that's a bad thing to do. Um, uh, also, just as a, as a you know, quick thing, I'm not sponsoring Nike right now. I'm just wearing a Nike shirt because I haven't changed it on my workout clothes yet. So here you go. Um, I just noticed that I never really dress up a lot for you guys, but uh, one of these days, I promise, I probably won't either. So, <laughs> But anyways, I want to talk about my investing rules, right? Because uh, one thing I learned through the life of hard knocks, especially with investing, those that kind of investing with hard knocks, right? Um, I learned a lot of good, valuable things, especially during the last recession. And the thing is, I see patterns happening again. You know, people start getting antsy. They want to jump in. Sometimes people are investing in things that really don't, aren't even real things, right? Uh, there's people investing in, in companies that are, aren't even real right now. Blank check companies, IPO companies, that don't even have a product or a service, but people are throwing money at it, right? Um, this is why mutual fund and hedge fund managers are like your riskiest people right now. But I want to talk about like, if you're looking at an investment, how do you know it's good for you? Not for the person offering for you, but for you right now. So I want to talk about five key areas. I actually have more questions or more points that I look than that, but these are really five key points that if you, if you really answered positively to these, you would probably feel very at peace because I'll tell you, an investment's not worth it if you do not have peace of mind. If you can't feel comfortable and sleep at night knowing that your money's invested somewhere, that's not the place for you. No matter how good the investment might seem, that is not the investment for you. So here's the number one thing I use to eliminate most opportunities is one, is there a reason beyond money that I want to invest in this? Is there a way I can tie it in with my passions or with my interests that I have? For example, I actually think real estate's fascinating. Now, not every aspect of real estate, though. Understand that. For example, you know, I hear a lot of my friends talk about wholesaling properties. That has zero attraction to me. Now, you can make amazing millions and millions of dollars doing that kind of business. But for me, that is, sounds absolutely like just horrible. Like I would much rather dance with that pink flamingo in the background right there. That's pretty much it, right? Um, it's just not interesting to me. You know, not to say that's not a good thing to do, but it's not the thing for me. So I always look at, is there a reason I would want to do it? Because here's the truth, guys. Uh, if I want to invest in something, right? I'm not going to invest in something that, you know, and I learned this from retiring twice, right? Becoming financially independent twice. You don't want to invest in something that feels like a job, that feels like you're just doing it for the paycheck. If you're going to put time and energy into it, especially, it should be something you enjoy, something that kind of lights you up, right? So that's number one is, do I have a reason to, do, to invest in this beyond the money? Because by the way, everything looks awesome when you look at the money and the numbers. It's got to have some personal connection to you. Number two, how well do I understand this investment? Do I understand what makes it work? Why I get paid? You know, why it makes money? Do I understand the real economic engine behind it that, that allows it to be profitable? Because if I, the better I understand it, the better I understand that there's something I might be able to do if something goes wrong, right? Um, or if something goes, or could I make it better than it actually is, you know, than what's returning right now? Um, maybe I'm not investing at all, but do I have an understanding of it to say, this makes sense. It's not a mystery to me. I can, you know, I could probably explain it easily to my spouse. You know, even if it might have some intricacies to it, I can at least give the basic gist of it because I understand it. So how well do you understand it? Do you really understand it? If you don't, don't do it. Um, you know, I'll give you an example. 
I had a friend that introduced me to a company where they paid you 12% interest every 24 days, right? So 12% interest every 24 days. Oh, sorry. Take that back. No, um, it was a t reverse that 24% interest every 12 days. Now that sounds too good to be true. Don't worry. It was, um, and then even he admitted, he said, Chris, here's the thing. This violates all the principles we talk about with investing, but dang, the money's hard to pass up. He's like, so my goal is because he used the rule of 72, right? 24%. Well, every 12 days, that means in 36 days, if you reinvested that money, it would double itself itself. So it would double itself every 36 days, which by the way, is not even possible. It's like when the guy reached out to me and said, Hey, Chris, this thing makes four to 6% a week, not a month or a year. And even a month would be pretty crazy, right? A week. And I was like, bull, that is not going to return that. Um, and he told me with it now, in his, in that example, that other one, right. Uh, that guy told me, he's like, yeah, it's invested in the Forex. I'm like, nobody makes that much money. Even George Soros can't make that kind of money in the Forex. So eh, no way. Well, this lady, same thing. This, this woman actually found out she owned the company. Uh, this company is called 12 daily pro, right? You could probably Google it and find 12 daily pro online. Well, guess what? Total Ponzi scheme, right? Obviously, um, she could not afford to pay 24% every 12 days. The feds, you know, the Securities Exchange Commission froze our accounts. The whole thing blew up. People lost their money. People were complaining and whining that they didn't have any money. Well, that, that they, they threw their retirement money in there. And how are they going to retire now? Uh, well, hello. You, for, you didn't even understand what it was invested in. Even when I asked my friend, what is she investing in to get these kind of returns? He said, honestly, I don't know. And it even says in the contract, you could lose all your money. So, and they did. They lost all their money. Unless the people like pulled their principal out fast enough, right? People lost their shirts. That's the thing, guys, is that, you know, do you understand it well enough to know what it actually is? Uh, three, and this goes really close to that. These are really my big three, right? You know, one is interest or passion beyond the money. Two is uh, how well do I understand it? And then three is how much control do I have? These are the three big ones for me. Do I have control of this investment? You know, for example, if something goes wrong, you know, can I get recourse? Um, you know, I, we've interviewed guys like Mitch Steven on here before, right? Like when he does his investments, I love it because he'll, he'll have people, you know, lend money on a specific property. You are on title for that property. You are basically the bank. You are the bank lender on that property and he's paying you returns on it. Now, if he, for, if he, if he doesn't make his payments, you foreclose on it. You, that's your property. It's all yours. And because he's only leveraging about, you know, 50 to 60%, right? So say you gave him, you know, it's worth a hundred thousand. He's probably going to borrow from you about 50 to 60,000. So there's equity. There's at least 40,000 equity in there. That's a good thing. There's control. There's some security in there because you have that first position. Now, do you have control in the stock market? Uh-uh. None at all. Buying and selling, by the way, is not control. Just the ability to click and act and say, choose, I'm going to choose that stock or that fund or this fund. And that's not control. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about if something were to go wrong, can you do something about it? Or if it's going right, can you do something to make it return better? Just like I explained before, how much control do you really have? I will sacrifice return any day to have more control. This is why I love buying my own real estate properties. Because as much as I love syndications, and I'll put money in those too, right? I'll put in funds and syndications, just like the ones we've talked about on the show. However, it's, you know, I have to make sure I've got good, you know, collateral there. I got to make sure I have good control, you know, if, especially if something were to go wrong. If I don't, that's not a good thing. And, and that's why I love buying my own properties. There is nobody else to answer to. It's me, right? I might have property managers managing it for me, but all, I call all the shots. I don't have to wait about to hear from different partners or anything like that, I call the shots. So that gets extra bonus points, right, for that. So one is, is passion beyond the money or interest beyond the money. Two is understanding. Three is control. Four is predictability. Can I have predictable, stable cash flow from this property? I like to call this predictable profits, right? You know, the two Ps there, predictable profits. Is it predictable and profitable? One, am I actually going to make good cash flow? Is it actually profitable where I'll make money? Two, is it predictable? Meaning that how much certainty do I have that it will pay that? You know, for example, there are some investments that are more speculative. Now, if you go in like the oil and gas industry, right? You buy investments there. There's some speculation there. 
it might be profitable, but it may not be predictable. So how much of a predictability can you have? You know, I was just recently talking with uh, one of my past, case, past guests that we had on here before. If you guys remember Randy Lawrence, the real estate preacher, you know, he talked about, you know, how he pays certain returns. He pays like a 7% preferred rate and then a 5% bonus on the back end, you know, per year. And so people will go for that easily because they say, well, I know that I'll make my money. I'll, I'll get this set amount of money. Like I'll get this every single quarter, this much money he's paid since 2003 or whatever. Like I know I'll get paid. And so people will say, cool, I I'll buy into that. Even if there is a promise of a better return somewhere else, people are like, yeah, but that's predictable. It's easy. It's not guesswork. I understand it. Right. It's, it's simple to do. Sometimes simplicity is like that, that best option to go with. So again, predictable profits. This is why I love buying real estate because I, I know what my profits are going to be, generally speaking, before I jump into the deal, before I even put any money into it. Guys, that's, that's awesome. And if it's regular stable cash flow, if it's not monthly, at least quarterly, if you're getting paid, awesome. Now, if you're not going to get paid for years down the road, you might question that, right? Um, I had, a, I had a, a client who said, hey, here's the business idea that we're going to do. And I said, great. Well, when do you start to be profitable? He said, two years. I said, that better be a back burner in business investment deal that you're doing there. Put that on a back burner. Instead, what's on the front burner? What can we actually start getting cash flow today? And we went through some different ideas about what he could do in his business. Did he take those ideas? Nope. Uh, did he ever get paid from that deal? Not really. Um, in fact, the, the, the business idea I gave him, I just sound like Elmer Fudd, but it, but it, but it, that's all folks. <laughs> Anyways, um, the idea I gave him was something to actually sell off the idea to another company to speed up the process. And uh, guess what? He didn't do it. He didn't try to get signed on as like an employee or whatever it might be. The company actually went and created their own version of it just a few years later. His thing, totally obsolete. So it's key. So again, Pat, you know, do you have interest beyond the money? Do, two, do you have control? Or two, do you understand it? Three, do you have control? Four, is it predictable and profitable? And then five is who? Who is it invested with? Like when I mentioned Randy Lawrence, he's been paying since 2003. You know, Mitch Steven, I mentioned earlier, that guy's been paying for decades, right? It's really awesome to know who you're investing with. It's so important. You know, many times, like when people are like, hey, what do you think of that Grant Cardone fund? I said, Grant Cardone's not an investor. He's a marketer. I don't trust that. You know, maybe that's got nice popularity. Awesome. Good for him. Um, I would question that big time because he's a marketer. He will attract other marketers. I'll tell you, good operators attract other good operators. If you want to find the right people, get in the right circles. Don't go for the people that are going for the pie in the sky or just talking big numbers. Those people are the people that lose money and they lose other people's money, including your own. But I go for the people that just do what I call as boring, sexy stuff because boring is sexy, right? If people are just going and, and use their money to, you know, do the same deal over and over, right? And it's the same thing they've done. Like, you know, Lane Kaoka, I talk about his show. There's a lot of his deals. I mean, he'll do some new deals every once in a while and some variances, but when he does this normal everyday deal, I think, okay, all right, I, I'm interested in that deal. If it's apartment building, just like the ones he's bought before, oh, look, it's Huntsville, Alabama. He's done that several times. Cool. I would trust that more. But really, the thing I'm looking for is what happened, like, especially in the last recession, right? Did they keep paying even when things hit the fan? Did they honor their word? Who are you really investing with? Again, it's not about the investment. The numbers can look amazing, but it's really about who is it you're investing with and what is that, what's going on there? That guys, that's what I look for. That's what I think is sexy. You know, the boring stuff they do over and over the guys that have great integrity or women that have great integrity in what they do with their investments. That is what I look at. Now I want you to take these five and think about it. Like think about this right here. Apply this to the stock market, apply this to your 401k. One, are you interested in it beyond the money? Maybe you might have fun watching the markets, but do you really? I will tell you, by the way, uh, people that have invested in the stock market, very tiny percentage actually have a passion beyond the money. Um, when I trained 200 people how to trade stocks and options, just a handful actually liked it beyond the money. And those are the people that actually still made money. Now, they didn't create good cash flow. They were still in the rat race, but at least they enjoyed it and they were profitable to some level. So 
passion. Now, do you have passion for your 401k? I, I bet you a lot of you guys are ignoring your 401k. You're ignoring the stock market, right? If you're doing that, that's a big warning sign. Two, do you understand it? Do you understand how they're making money? Do you understand that you don't even own a company? You don't own any stock in a company. You own a, a, a copy of a copy. You own a piece of paper tied to the real asset, but it's, it has no real, real value. You're not an owner in that company. Even in a fraction of a degree, you basically have zero ownership. You know, do you really understand how that works? Do you understand how mutual fund money managers make their money? Do you understand how they have to, when they keep getting more money, they have to find investments even if they're bad. They have to keep putting money in. Do you understand that in a mutual fund that you can't, that as a mutual fund money manager, you can't unload stocks. If you know a stock's bad, you can't sell it all in one day because that's actually against the law. You can't dump a stock, crash it. That, that's there. If you have so much money, you can't do that kind of thing. So think about that. Do you understand those kind of rules? That's a big thing. Three, do you have any control over the stock market? No, zero. Do you have a control over the stock that's invested in? Do you really think you have control? Warren Buffett, do you think when he buys a business, he just buys a stock? Or does he buy ownership in the company that allows him to have control? He can go into the board of directors meetings, make call some shots and manipulate his returns, especially if something goes wrong or to make it more profitable so he makes more money different than being someone in the stock market. By the way, you have zero control over it. Um, is it predictable? Heck no, it's not predictable at all. Now, maybe you buy in that boring stock that pays predictable dividends, sure. Uh, but even that, uh, even that's not being so great lately. And then who, do you even know who's managing your money? I will tell you as a, when I was a financial advisor with my securities license, helping people buy mutual funds, I could even talk to the fund manager. In fact, they made it completely off limits. You could not go and call or email and contact that fund manager. They are to be left alone. No one talks to them. Did I know who they were? Not at all. You know, when you buy a Fidelity fund, you realize that sometimes the fire fund managers hire new ones. So what made that fund successful before, now it's not successful anymore because it's a different person. See, just these five questions alone, the fact you put money in mutual funds and 401k, you are the riskiest gambler I've ever met. You know, if you want certainty and peace of mind at night, find ways to find investments that actually fit these kind of criteria where you have passion beyond the money or interest beyond the money. You understand what it's doing and how to make it work, how it ticks. You have control. It's predictable and profitable. And you know who is investing in it. Guys, even if you just follow these five things, and there's more questions that I would ask here, but if you just focus on those five things, it would change your life. So I hope you took notes. Unless you're driving, don't take notes. Listen to it later, take notes. But write these down and start applying this to your own investments, right? And, and actually rate them. Say, do I really understand this? Is this, is this something I like? Is this something I have control in? Do I, it, you know, is it predictable and profitable? Who's making this money for me? Do I even know who they are? Guys, that's number one. Those are the key things you should be looking for in any investment. If you want not just financial independence, but financial freedom, because you cannot be free if your mind is not free because you're worrying about it. That is the key, guys. I hope you take it to heart and use it in your life. Make it a wonderful week, and we'll see you later.